When we think about Australia, we think about the, uh, one of the world's uh, driest continents and driest but inhabited continents in the world. And, and, but there are people who have been living in this continent for thousands of years and, and they have lived with the dryness <coughs> and all the you know, things that come with the driest continent uh, in this world. So, however, at the same time, we see that a different kind of knowledge about water is propagated in this country. And uh, uh, sometimes it becomes important for young people uh, like Jessica to step aside and look into what made this possible, you know, the thousands of years of living within the driest in, you know, continent in the world. I first met Jessica in ANU, she was, when I first came in, I was, I was actually at that time very unsure of myself, uh, 10 years ago, and Jessica was a PhD student, came to say hello to me, and I have heard you work on water, I also work on water, and, and we struck a friendship with each other, and I guess in a way we understood uh, you know, each other's perspective, where we were coming from, coming from although we worked on very different areas. And I worked in India, and she was working uh, at the time, beginning her PhD. <coughs> She's, uh, the other common ground that we have is both of us are human geographers, but, and, and, and both of us had had very long interest on ecological and social justice issues. But what she has done is fantastic. She has published this book Mare River Country, an ecological dialogue with traditional owners. And that uh, really has exposed the way indigenous people of Australia have seen water, lived with, with water in this country. And uh, as a research fellow in Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, she continued these interests with respect to native title issues. I guess that was a very applied aspect of her work and that she's expanding now. She has recently accepted a role as a senior research fellow at the University of Canberra. So it's again having her over here is a sort of midi between uh, the Australian National University and the University of Canberra. And uh, she's examining the integration of bushfire risk in urban and regional planning. I'm sure water is playing a very important role in that study. So welcome. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'll be working on earth and air next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's really lovely to be here. I just wanted to um, reiterate the acknowledgement yesterday of the traditional owners of this country where we meet and also the traditional owners from along the Murray River who supported my research, with whom I have a research agreement with, who support me to give presentations such as this one, and also um, the people in um, the Wamba Wamba and Brappa Brappa people who have been working with more recently. Um, and I'd like to thank the conference organisers for um, giving me this keynote spot. It's, it's a real pleasure. Uh, this is a, uh, I like this photo, I took it in 2009. We'd been having about 10 years of drought. And the drought was just about to break, but I didn't know that then. And this is, you can see the dry the dry um, grass and the storm clouds. This is the Murrumbidgee River uh, floodplain in um, Gundagai. You can see the bridges that go over it. The, the town used to be built on this, but they moved it up, up the hill after a flood came through. In Marguerite's keynote uh, yesterday, which I keep joking was an introduction to my keynote today, <laughs> Uh, we learned about the importance of knowing nature's cultures or social natures, um, as well as situated knowledges. To this I want to add ecological dialogue, and I will, I will get to that in this talk. My talk um, builds on 
the work of Marguerite and others um, about how this situated nature's cultures knowledge is expe expressed with respect to water management framed by Cartesian dualism. But I speak from the intercultural context in Australia that is the negotiation of Indigenous peoples' water issues in the Murray-Darling Basin and specifically the southern part of the Murray-Darling Basin. Just in case you don't know where it is, here it is. And the, the Murray-Darling Basin has the three largest rivers in Australia, uh, the Murray River, the Darling River, and the Murrumbidgee, which flows into the Murray. Uh, we've heard a lot already about the, how the narrow perceptions of water are part of the nature culture binary, when water is framed as simple matter, as a resource for the nation, as Rowan also spoke about last night, water is separated from its history, ecology and place. As a discrete resource that humans manage through engineering and technical feats, water can be moved without regard for the consequences of all the relationships that it holds in place. This is a, um, a picture of the Murray River as a uh, um, plumbing system, I suppose. Uh, so this is sort of an extreme version, which is, you know, used. It's a way that people uh, work with the Murray River. You can get a job as a river operator in Canberra to operate the river. Um, to be fair, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority have many other images of the Murray River that are not so uh, bleak, I suppose would be the term. Uh, it's an arid place, most of the Murray Darling Basin. This is the Darling River. And um, just a couple of photos. This is just some of the incredible industry that we have from the river water out in this semi arid country. This is Mawala, um, Mawa Lake Mawala. Um, it used to be a river red gum forest. And another one, another river red gum forest. This is un under the Hume Weir during the drought. This is now underwater because we've been having the rain. This is the Chow Willa. Back to the is this salt? No, it's that's just water. That's a dam. It's a Hume Weir. It's at the headwaters of the okay, weir. Okay. of the Murray. Um, this is out on the Chow Willa floodplain, which you heard about yesterday from Anna. This is one of the results of of our water management. So we have places that are drowned, we have places that are dry. This is, and I encourage you to go there. You have to see it to believe it. This is a salt place, Psyche Ben Lagoon. This is right next to Mildura. It's, al it's almost suburban Mildura. Um, and it's become a salt dump and that's improved the salt levels in the Murray, the main Murray River, but we've lost this place. And this very close is another, um, toxic billet bomb. This one's uh, sulfuric acid. It's more toxic than battery acid. And there are many, many uh, billet bombs like this in Australia where water was held and um, I don't know about the chemistry, but when that water was released um, and the soil was exposed to air, it became toxic and went orange. You can see the orange along the, um, the edge there. So these were the places that sustain life in Australia that we write our national poetry about and now they are not just supporting life, they're threatening life. So in this context, Indigenous people bring a knowledge and a language of connection and place, but are of course constrained in how they can express that knowledge in discourses that privilege science, rationality and reason. The history books tell us that the spiritual homelands of the Murray River peoples have given way to the contemporary priorities of modern agricultural production in this Australia's agricultural heartland. But this portrayal of history is actually what um, is actually false. It's what um, Latour would call modern thinking. Aboriginal people's stories get positioned as a narrative that is spiritual or traditional, whilst the narrative of um, nation building is one of economic growth or development. From the modern thinkers' perspectives, these narrat narratives cannot coexist and one must be sacri sacrificed for the other as part of a theological path of progress. This way of thinking is false and critically disables our responses to ecological devastation. The far-reaching relationships that are sustained by water enmesh 
both water as a resource for production and water as an ancestral life force. And this is the analysis I undertook by bringing the work of theorists such as Latour, Haraway, Timothy Mitchell, Val Plumwood and many others into dialogue what Indigenous people are saying and doing in response. We've heard a lot about modern universalist rationalist knowledge. Let's talk now about the Indigenous knowledge of country. So country is a term Indigenous people use to um, generally describe their tr uh, lands and waters that they inherit from their ancestors and their ancestral creator beings. Um, in a very profound sense, country is the place where the rules for existence come from, where law, language and culture are embedded in the landscape. Nature and culture are blended. Humans are within the world and not taking a view of it. We have multiple agencies. This is sort of the more than human context. Um, we have multi-species relationships, solidarities and obligations within a sentient ecology, feelings of love, care and attachment towards the environment, moving us away from causal relationships of power. These are communicative relationships. There is an ecological dialogue going on all around us all the time. Uh, this is a photo of Lee jo Joachim, who has many children, and here are four of his kids. Um, and he's standing in front of a canoe tree. So this tree uh, bark was, the tree was cut and a canoe was made many years ago. It's a huge one outside the Yorta Yorta uh, Aboriginal Corporation in Barma. Um, and you can see some old pictures there of Aboriginal people using canoes to, to get out onto the river and spear fish. Lee Joachim is a Yorta Yorta man and he talks about how we must listen to the river country as part of understanding and responding to poor river health. He told me, he was wondering why people don't listen to the river country and I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, you know, the creatures, the frogs and the crickets, they're not making those noises that tell you that they're healthy and alive. And as Debbie Rose has said, to hear is to witness and to witness is to become entangled. Another really important part of Indigenous knowledge about country is the focus on connections rather than separations. And elsewhere, um, I have called this connectivity, which is a, goes much further than the, um, the ecologist concept of connectivity to include history, culture, law, language, and so on. This is not a messy, undifferentiated holism but an opportunity to focus on connections and identify those relationships that are, that are important. Crucially, water is not just another participant in connectivity, but is a key connecting life force because all living things need water to survive. The life supported by water is not through weak or distant networks, but strong life-giving connections. And once we can understand this, that our lives are held in the hands of other beings and vice versa, we have the groundwork for building ethical obligations between species and between all sorts of life forms. As Lee Jo Aikham has said about the Murray River, the importance of the river is to ensure that it is seen as a continuing living being, that it is respected like any other person should be respected, it has got the ability to cleanse itself, it has got the ability to nurture itself and it has got the ability to ensure that the life that it touches upon also has an ongoing process. Now you can no longer spear a fish from a canoe on the Murray River because the water is too murky to even see them. It's carrying 40 times the sediment load. In any case, the native fish are outnumbered by the introduced carp. Mary, Muddy Muddy Elder, Mary Pappen, has talked to me about how she can't take her kids and grandkids to collect bush tucker because river regulation has reduced the frequency, size and extent of flow regimes and the little creeks that used to flood up now and then and were the best places to go, they no longer do so. Nut and Jerry Elder, Agnes Ringney, has talked to me um, who's now passed away now, has talked to me about how she grew up on the Murray River and um, how the, the food from the Murray River supplemented the mission food and how they used to go, fi um, go 
fishing with spears made from bamboo. She talked about how the river is in her blood and she feels part of the river because the river sustained her. She also told me about um, a place along the river that they were forbidden to go to and about the beauty of the place, the clear water and the, um, the white sand. Now a, a slow, muddy flow of regulated water goes past this place. The traditional owners are talking about a culture that is not taught in school or through books, but through active practice on country. This is indeed a situated knowledge. In their lifetimes, the elders have experienced rapid change. Many of the uh, large dams have been built since the 1930s, and um, they, have, they have grown up being able to live off the river, and now they are una unable to teach their children. This is a rupturing of knowledge that has been passed down through the generations. Unique to this place, it's a contemporary dispossession of Indigenous people's cultural heritage. And Lee Jo Aiken um, expli explains it in explicit terms that he feels that he, as the river dies, he, as a, he, as a yorta yorta man, his people are also dying. I want to now turn to Indigenous people's agency around cultural flows and Indigenous water rights. So there's a lot of um, amazing Indigenous leaders from this part of the country who have been strategising about creating a space where you've got a degraded river, um, over-allocated competition for water and in of increasing economic value. Now, the logo here is the Murray Lower Darling Rivers Indigenous Nations, an alliance of Indigenous people from along the rivers who I did my doctoral thesis with. And um, there's a, a couple of, there's a group photo of them next to Blowering Dam in, uh, near Tumut and a photo from when they signed a memorandum of understanding with the Murray Darling Basin Commission. Also some photos from uh, another workshop and, and a protest which they held about the, the dying river red gum forests, um, which they held in Melbourne with environmental groups. Oops, save that. Um, in lobbying for greater recognition of their water issues, Indigenous people in South East Australia have de developed strategies and theories around an Indigenous water allocation and the broader notion of cultural flows in response to two key triggers, the poor environmental health, the inland river country, and the historic and contemporary failure of the Australian state and common law to recognise the property rights and political status of Australia's First Nations. Cultural flows is a term that strategically follows the language of environmental flows. I can just imagine the meetings where you'd be hearing environmental flows, environmental flows, and then someone saying, what about cultural flows? Indigenous people use the term as an intercultural translation tool that expresses the connection between culture and water and the absence in water policy and management of Indigenous water values. Now, this is now, is now a changing space. They cannot rely on environmental flows to look after country because environmental flows is blind, blind to law, language and culture. Mary Pappen those little creeks of value to her will not necessarily match the environmental priorities for the very small environmental water allocations. A minimal definition of the concept of cultural flows is that it is a way of returning water to the river country envisioned by the traditional owners. So it's very, very much in this context of over allocation. In keeping with a holistic approach, Cultural flows are often articulated by the traditional owners as a flow of water that reconnects diverse values that depend on healthy freshwater ecologies, spiritual, social, environmental, economic values, and so on. As Yorta Yorta elder Henry Atkinson has said, cultural flows are a natural flow which allows everything to grow. Cultural flows inc include your history and your culture. So you see the mixing of the binaries. Unfortunately, the use of the word culture is a double-edged sword for Indigenous people. And here's a table I use sometimes in talks just to, exp um, 
articulate the difference between natural resource management and caring for country, which is, of course, a simplification, but um, people have talked to me about how they challenge to communicate caring for country in a natural resource management um, context, where, where NRM is characterised as modern, universal, rational, technical and cultural neutral, and caring for country is traditional, local, emotional, spiritual and culturally specific and very easily marginalised and, and, and interpreted in a very narrow frame. Another key problem, by, adop by adopting the term culture, Indigenous people express their values embedded in water, but they run the risk of reducing their legal and political rights to narrowly defined cultural activities. Another key problem is with cultural flows is how to interpret a philosophy about country into an amount of water that can be recognised as an Indigenous water allocation. Yet emphasising the importance of an Indigenous water allocation as part of their water rights arguments is to reduce the language of connectivity to a slice of the water pie. These are the contradictory binds that Indigenous people face when translating meaning and rights to binary frames that hyper-separate tradition, tradition and change, nature and culture and so on. No doubt environmentalists have had to face strategic compromises with environmental water allocations, a thinking that posits the river as just another consumer of river water and not the source of the water. Regarding Indigenous water issues, it's not an either or decision that needs to be made. To deal with the complexity and the breadth of the Indigenous water agenda, strategies require a suite of approaches in combination. And there's a lot of discussion about things like the Indigenous governance of environmental water, uh, consumptive water allocations, domestic water, native tidal water, cultural water, as well as um, more opportunities to do participatory decision making and so on, so as to begin to meet the broader cultural flows caring for country and Indigenous rights agendas. The language of connectivity, country and cultural flows will continue to be a part of this intercultural translation process that resonates with an audience seeking to engage with the big ideas about framing water and how we can build a better water ethic. Now I want to turn now to some of the work that um, Yaku are doing, which is a, uh, an Indigenous corporation um, with a membership of Wamba Wamba and Parappa Parappa people who are the traditional owners of country in um, southern New South Wales and northern Victoria around, around Daniloquin. And um, this is a, a map of the Edward and Wakul rivers and the Murray River as well. The yellow um, areas are the Edward Wakul River system, but they're also um, the forests that are sustained here. So it's a network of, ri of rivers and wetlands and forests, and it's surrounded by really flat plains that are for rice uh, grazing and rice production. And Daniloquin actually has the largest rice uh, mill in the southern hemisphere. It was closed during the drought, but has now reopened. And Indigenous people form part of the seasonal labour force in the mill. Um, Yakua, at times with the Mildren Alliance from the Murray River and environmental NGOs, have been lobbying for land and water managed that is more in line with nature's cultures, situated knowledges, with country. Some of this work includes getting the state forests transitioned into national parklands, um, an Indigenous protected area for the Wirai Forest, um, making arguments about cultural flows and an Indigenous water allocations, and many other matters, diverse matters, such as community health and so on. They have had some success, but it remains a contested space. And I'll read to you from... Sorry. I'll read to you from, this is a couple of months ago, uh, the a State Parliamentary Committee came to Daniloquin to receive evidence. Um, there's a new Liberal government in the state of New South Wales. The Labor government had previously transferred state forest land to national <laughs> parks, including one area, the Wirai Forest, to become an Indigenous protected area. So this is now being reviewed under the new government. 
And the committee um, asked um, Yakawa board member Debbie Flower, who you see walking here in the forest with her sons. She said, um, they said, Miss Flower, we are grappling with the history of these forests and we were told yesterday, and it is in numerous submissions to us, that the forests in this region were grown by the white man. As a traditional owner, how would you respond to this statement? So this is 2012 in Deniliquin. So this is, uh, Debbie has to then say, well, I would respond by saying that the stories that have been passed down from the elders for generations tell us otherwise. We have burial grounds that are thousands of years old and midden sites that are at least 10,000 year olds. And of course, there are the, the scar, lots of scar trees and the scar trees being the, canoe, being the canoe trees. So this is sort of the contested space. Um, and you can see the way that... Um, I haven't seen the submissions, although I'm looking forward to following that up. But I suppose asserting that all the trees in the Weirai forest um, are, are planted is, is either to erase its natural values, relying on the nature culture binary, or its indigenous values, relying on the tradition change binary, or both. It's a really complex space for Indigenous people to express um, themselves. And it's really contested because so many other peoples now call this place home and have their own connections to this country. Debbie Flower is reviving the Wamba Wamba weaving tradition along with other women. And she is keen for water to be returned to those places in the forest where the best grasses for basket weaving grow. There is an opportunity for this with environmental water but only if the criteria is broadened out as, um, as basket weaving is not included in ecological values. And so getting the, an indigenous protected area and getting access to decision making over water is really important for this sort of management. And I just want to show a, um, this is a, uh, a, uh, a little translation tool that Yakura have used in a, a number of their submissions. I've um, made the fonts higher and uh, larger and smaller just to emphasise it a bit. But it's just trying to express the sort of different approaches to how you would look after the Weirai forest. And I think it's a really um, uh, great way, a great communication tool, because um, it shows how the same activities remain, but there's just a different emphasis. They go from... Um, the current, the state forest management, which is a focus on commercial timber harvesting, um, firewood collection, grazing, recreational use, and traditional owner use is the hierarchy of use. They want this to move to cultural and environmental management with traditional owner use, then the management of recreational use, and then controlling the firewood collection. It is also possible to have um, selective timber harvesting as part of this management and, and also in, as part of their knowledge tradition of country which of course includes economic values. So just to, I um, don't know how I'm going for time but I'm at the end bit so I hope that's okay. Forest water culture. Right now it's raining which is great for nature and culture. <laughs> and you don't have to make a rights argument to have the rainfall on your country. The wet conditions, however, do take the pressure off water reform. When the weather goes into the next drought cycle, we will see again those pressure points highlighted as competing and aligning arguments are made about water policy and the river ecologies again pushed to the brink. The traditional owners have a language that identifies water as the key connecting life force, and they also have a language that expresses loss about the magnitude of what we are losing. And they have a language that draws our attention to the stark logic of placing river health first. And they are doing things about this, and they, have, they, have, they are getting outcomes for their country. We need to peg down the authority of universal knowledge, join the ecological dialogue and embrace the uncertainty of river variability in order to better live with water, for we cannot live without it. There is no cultural flow from a dead river, nor are there indigenous or non-indigenous water rights. And this is the ecological context 
that we need to return to and then frame that ecological context within country. You can draw on many different knowledge traditions to critique modern water management, but why not listen to the traditional owners who call this place home? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks for that beautiful presentation. And uh, really some serious thoughts to take home. Any questions? Yes. Jessica, the National Water Initiative recognized the cultural needs of other local people, but at the time didn't recognize their economic needs. But since then, I understand the New South Wales government set up a water trust to help um, Aboriginal groups uh, fulfill their economic needs. What's happening with that under the new government? Actually, I wanted, if I may just interrupt, I also wanted to ask you, you did say that, well, things are changing a little bit, and I, I would like you to, you know, sort of really uh, reflect in more detail about uh, what is changing and, and whether or not it's a co-option, really, or in what way they are changing, which really connects to yeah, the yeah. There's a, I mean, there's a, there's a lot going on, and and it's national, um, because there's water reform across Australia, and so Indigenous people are, um, are, are involved in that, and they are strategically getting involved too, on a number of, on a number of fronts. Um, where my work comes from, the um, the destruction of country, which undermines rights and culture, is a, is is really in the forefront of a lot of this language. Uh, in other places where there may be rivers that are not regulated, where country is healthy, you, there's, and where there's, where there's not an over allocation of consumptive water use, there's more space to be able to talk about economic consumptive water licences. In the Murray-Darling Basin, there was a cap put on consumptive licences in 1994, which has been problematic, but it's sort of a line in the sand of there's no more. Yes, under state legislation, there are opportunities under the, the Water Act that, um, the State Water Act that, uh, for Indigenous people to get um, small amounts of, of water. I mean, there's, there's barriers in terms of uh, the cost and the infrastructure involved, and so those things are being worked through. I don't know if it pre... I think it predates the National Water Initiative. Actually, I think it's 2000, the state legislation, whereas the National Water Initiative, I think, is 2004. Yes, that's right. um, the National Water Initiative is, uh, the f was the first explicit recognition of Indigenous water vi values in a, in a sort of national water framing although it was uh, quite qualified and with a focus on native title rights, which is a very limited um, recognition of indigenous uh, relationships and um, with country as well as their political and legal standing. Um, so the space for Yakua to have economic, there's different spaces. For example, you might not be able to get a consumptive water allocation, but um, it is possible to trade environmental water if the trading is, um, if that money is then used for environmental purposes. I don't understand the rules exactly, it's a really complicated system, but there are opportunities to um, generate income. However, it's a really, uh, because ecology and economy, of course, are in the binary tradition in, in oppositional corners and you can't have their, their opposites, you know. So that binary tells us what happened. Uh, we necessarily had to sacrifice the Murray River for our agriculture. It tells us what looking after the Murray will do. It will be at the sacrifice of our agriculture and it denies the logic that a healthy river supports both our economies and ecologies and you do not have economies from a failing river. Um, but because of that separation, when Indigenous people are often matched with environmental issues, then bring a economy into the conversation, it's seen as being inauthentic, um, it's seen as not being Indigenous, and it's seen as not being a legitimate part of the conversation. But what we're losing out by, we're losing out on listening to Indigenous people about what they're saying, and we're also losing out on thinking about 
the way ecology and economy relate to each other in the broader water management because of course the indigenous water rights agenda is is only ever going to have a small you know the small amounts of water in small places the whole system needs an overhaul if we're going to be able to um, turn it around so we need to get those big ideas into the larger mm. conversations mm. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes thanks Jessica um, my understanding is that in negotiations between Maori and the government uh, there's recently been a decision to give the Waikato River the status of personhood and I wonder what would happen if you gave the river system the status of personhood in the negotiation of these interests and what also if we move it into an international dimension what would happen if Australia signed the UN Charter on the rights of Indigenous people and there were coalitions built with other Indigenous people like Canadians or other um, With regard to the personhood comment, um, I bring up Leslie Head's work where she talks about when we, when we say things like that, that the river should be given personhood, it sounds... Um, crazy because of the hyper separation between human and non-human and so the qualities that are human talk communication agency cannot be part of the non-human world and um, what Leslie Head has written about recently but a lot of people been writing about is that we need to um, address the binary and have a less exclusive notion about personhood in order to make this idea of the the river as person less alien and 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 more of a to understand the uh, what we share rather than those those differences which is w that we turn to all the time in turn to all the time um, with respect to the rights of indigenous I'll just say one thing about that um, Stephen Ross who I'm currently co-authoring a report on about Yakura cultural water issues will be out maybe this year. Um, he went to the um, UN Forum on Indigenous Water Issues that was in New York, I think, last year, and got cultural flows adopted. The language of the sort of that the strategising that the Indigenous people are doing along the Murray River, he got that sort of put into the sort of um, national, the not national, global Indigenous language around water. So it's really interesting because a lot of the was actually one of the really early. You know, you have these moments when you hear the the hear things and it was what uh, Monica, Yoda Yoda woman Monica Morgan said to me that the UN's water rights, human rights of water takes the agenda in the wrong direction. It was one of those ones where you, you go, oh I'm hearing something here, what is it, you know, that, that you know, humans have this right to water for all their things and when you resituate that into country you can see what Monica's saying. Um, so I don't know um, about a about that, but I, a lot of this will be worked out in those, these sorts of issues will be worked out in local places, in water management plans, rather than on the international scene. But I think that solidarity across nations is really important. Okay. Yeah. All right, I don't see any other burning questions, but I really welcome you to talk to Jessica and, 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 and also Julie about their work and their presentations and and, 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 and on behalf of everybody and the conference organizers, I really express my uh, gratitude and appreciation to Julie and Jessica, both of you, for two wonderful presentations and, and, and wonderful work that you're doing. Yes, thank you.